Yesterday, we were talking about uh, the different diagnostics. Remember, we uh, talked about um, ex situ diagnostics, you know, extracting from a flame. Now we're kind of, I, I think, uh, we stopped yesterday kind of smack in the middle of sampling, how people do sampling. Um, so we were kind of talking about perturbations. Like, so a lot of times we, like, We'll put a quartz probe right into the middle of the flame and um, and extract using the quartz probe. So um, I've been doing this for many years, and I know this is an issue that we have perturbations to the flame from from temperature you know, in the temperature distribution, the the flow field, the um, uh, radical distribution, and people have demonstrated this multiple times over the last many decades. Um, but we don't have a lot of choice uh, in terms of sampling. It's, it's really hard to, to extract particles from a flame or a reactive environment um, without perturbing it. So, so uh, there are ways that we can try to think about how to do this, and this is a challenge. You know, this is a challenge for you, a challenge for all of us. If you're gonna try to look at particle, say you're looking at uh, particle synthesis um, under reactive conditions, not even in a flame. You, it, a lot of times you really want to know what those particles are, what they look like, what their characteristics are. Um, but if you're going to perturb the chemistry around your sampling, then you, you're maybe not going to get the most realistic um, example of what your particles really are at the time and you want to see them in your flow. So, uh, and this is, this is another example of, I'm not sure, maybe this is, so this, uh, you may have seen this, I, I think I showed this on the first day, this, uh, extraction and then looking at the different particles. I think there are different explanations for this, for these data. This is a mass spectrum of that experiment I showed uh, also yesterday. <laughs> I think I showed this experiment two times um, where they extract the, par the full particles and then saw these like really high masses in this kind of bumpy like, you know, distribution and maybe those are um, aggregated particles because they're ionizing the full particle and then getting their mass spectrum. Um, but it's also possible that when they stick, when they use their probe, in, inside their probe, they're actually getting some kind of condensation. This, some of this may be happening in their probe. So that's a question. And that's a question that I often have for our experiments is, what's happening inside that probe? You know, I, I, I said yesterday, we have, we sometimes worry about even chemistry that's going on in the probe if we're not diluting and, and dropping the temperature fast enough. So, um, so here's an example of where there is a probe, probe, you know, once you suck the particles in the probe, so this is a, the SMPS results that we've looked at a couple of times, actually, um, and you see a particle size distribution, but that peak to the left, they think, is, is uh, something that happens inside the probe. You're generating particles inside your probe. Um, so I think that, you know, this is something we always have to think about and, and be careful of when we're analyzing the data. Um, so here's, um, this is the extraction technique um, where you have a, the stagnation plate above the flame. We talked about this yesterday a little bit, um, but this is what it looks like. So here's your, your um, premixed flame, and then there's the stable, a stagnation plate or stabilization plate above that, and it has a hole in it. And then there's a, an open like um, tube shape in the plate itself and they send gas through that hole um, and suck up the particles into the stabilization plate or stagnation plate. And that theory is, you can, if you know the temperature of the stagnation plate, then when you do the modeling, you can account for that. So then you know everything. In, and so this is a nice approach, is to actually just model your whole um, probe in with your experiment. So this is another way of dealing with probe effects, is to actually um, take that, take the probe into account. But if you're really trying to sample what's what's happening at the higher temperatures, then um, it's really hard to do. You can't just model it if you don't know what you're, you know, what, that you're actually trying to get data to validate your model. Um, so, uh, so this is a, but I do think this is a really nice uh, approach. This is what the temperature distribution looks like. Um, so you can. Um, so you see the experimental data or are those symbols, and then they go and model the temperature distribution um, with that stagnation 
plate in there. And then they change the height of that relative to the burner and, and do the modeling. So this is, this is a, the, the bonus of this type of uh, sampling. Um, this is with the um, stagnation plate um, and, and looking at the effects of having the stagnation plate in there. So you actually see there's soot, so there's OH distribution. This is really important. So what you see is the radical distribution is depleted near the stag stagnation plate. So the chemistry you're trying to um, freeze and sample right at the stagnation plate or sampling region is just kind of being quenched right there. So you have to, like, um, if you don't know what that chemistry is and you're trying to figure out what it is, it's hard to do that when you have something that's perturbing it so much. So um, let's see, OH is the right... Maybe I didn't label this, didn't keep the labels. Oh yeah, OH is the right-hand column. And you can see the, um, the bar chart, on, and you can see that near the stagnation plate, which is on the uh, right-hand side, you, that the um, OH is dropping. Okay, yeah. And this is um, some more, uh, like, actually drawn out results with the stagnation plate sitting at 15 millimeters, which is what it is in the, the figure to the left as well. Um, so you see that the OH, when you do OH, the stagnation plate, near the stagnation plate, and that's a few millimeters. Like, that's a big... Um, spatial difference where you see the, the OH dropping right next to the stagnation plate. That's actually really significant. Um, so there's, uh, so that's in a premixed flame. In a diffusion flame, oftentimes people will take a, a metal uh, tube and drill a hole in it and then use that metal tube with the hole. And then they can move um, because the, uh, with a premixed flame, often you have kind of, you know, homogeneous uh, flame uh, across most of your flame. Again, the very edges, you'll have a, a, a different distribution, but mo through most of your flame, it's going to be the same. So it's quasi one-dimensional um, with height in the flame. Um, for, you know, diffusion flame, the soot is going to be, is going to have a radial distribution um, between the center and the edge of the flame. It's going to vary dramatically. So, um, it, so you can actually use this technique um, to not only move the burner up and down relative to the hole, but you can move it back and forth. So you can try to sample just individual locations in the flame. But this, this tube can have very large perturbations on the flame itself. So um, in fact, and, and clogging is a real problem in this technique. So when we do this experiment, we have an automatic, like if you try this, we, have, we actually have a, a little scrubber that every few seconds goes across like the tube. It's just you know automated to get to sweep across the tube um, and clean the soot that accumulates on the outside of the tube. So you can tell the tube is actually probably really perturbing um, our the um, distribution inside the flame itself. Um, and we think that this tube heats up and catalyzes reactions, especially if we have the tube. Um, Anywhere close enough to the edge or near the tip of the flame where we can get some oxygen up into that tube, we get oxidation of our species that are collected in the tube. Even though we're running a very high flow of nitrogen, of cold nitrogen through that tube, we still have enough oxidation because the tube itself warms up because it's sitting in the flame warming up. Um, and it gets really pretty darn hot. Like you can't easily touch it. It's really hot. Too. Um, so, and then people have demonstrated that this tube also has a big impact on, on temperature distribution. So again, I, I really worry. We do these experiments, but I really worry about the results. So we've actually stopped using this technique. We recently stopped using it because we use a, we're, I'm going to show you the, a different technique we use, but it, it has its own um, complications. So this is the technique we started to use. Um, and we, we um, basically entrain particles in a jet of inert gas, cold inert gas. So we often will use nitrogen, sometimes argon. It doesn't really matter too much as long as you can entrain some of the gas and particles from the flame. So we, have, we basically have a very, very tiny tube and, and generate a jet of, of nitrogen, for instance. And then we collect it. So on the gas comes from the left-hand side on here. 
there's a burner in between that you don't, can't, the flame isn't lit right in this picture. And then on the other side is um, our collector tube. So the jet of uh, gas goes into our collector tube along with the flame sample. Um, and then we can do whatever we you know, want with that. Often we'll send it into the aerosol mass spec or we'll collect on a grid um, to do TEM. Um, and we think that this technique seems to be better. So this is what it looks like with the flame there. Um, we get it as close to the flame as we can without, um, with, the, with the gas off, without it pertur visibly perturbing the flame. So um, what we don't want, if we can help it, is to, we try to avoid getting a lot of oxygen from the co-flow into our probe because we don't want to have the problems associated with, with um, oxidation. But we, it doesn't, we haven't seen that so much with, these, with this probe, maybe... Um, the material has an effect because it doesn't heat up as much. Um, so we uh, collaborated um, with Matthias Heim's group to do um, an, an, you know, a characterization of this technique. So this is what our flame looks like. That's the same, same linear Henkin burner we were looking at earlier uh, yesterday. Um, this is what the flame looks like with the tube in place, with our sampling or uh, tube in place without the jet on. Um, this is what it looks like with the jet on. And what you can see is it kind of, you know, wherever it is in the flame, it cuts out a little section of the flame. But the rest of the flame it just is unperturbed just by eye. So we thought, well, that doesn't mean that it's not perturbed. Um, uh, and, and what this helps is that we, we don't have a probe sitting in our flame. So if it's not sitting in the flame, it's not conducting... Um, uh, the heat isn't conducted to it, so it's not cooling, and you don't have the surface in the flame to catalyze reactions and to um, quench your, your radical species. So this is uh, what it looks like with the um, jet on. So this is what the, when we do the calculations, or when Matthias's group does the calculations, this is a temperature distribution looking down the end of the flame on the left-hand side. And then looking at the side of the flame, close to where we, are, we do our sampling. Um, and, and so this is without the jet on. And you can see in the left-hand side the little, um, uh, our little probe things um, sitting there. We actually usually have the probes closer together than this. Um, and then this is with the jet turned on. So the flow is coming from the left to the right. And you can see our jet of nitrogen is cold, is shooting through the flame, and it's advecting the, um, the particles and gas phase species just right at the bottom of that jet tube into our probe. Um, and so that's it from the, the end on. And then if you're looking straight down the jet, you see there's, you know, uh, at zero, that's where our tube is. Um, so that's cold. But right to the right of it, um, the, set, the temperature is unperturbed. You know, there's a little bit of perturbation right to the right of it. Um, but, you know, it's mostly, it's less perturbations than if you have a probe sitting in the flame. Uh, so this is what it looks like if you um, follow the flow, um, like a Lagrangian type calculation. You have uh, temperature on the left-hand side. Um, and then residence time. So if you're following, you know, particle mass, um, you're, you st if you start out, you know, at the bottom. So basically, this follows the um, a sample coming up from the burner, and when it hits, so that if we have the the probe sitting at six millimeters in the flame, um, if you once it gets to six millimeters, the temperature will drop because it's cold. Okay. So it's, it starts to hit that nitrogen and it cools off dramatically, right, at six millimeters. Um, so your, your particle has come up and now it's being drawn into that probe um, tube and it's cooler. Uh, so, and then if you're looking at um, the dilution effect, so your particles are coming up and then once it, the, you hit the jet in this configure, you know, for this calculation, they're immediately diluted, and here they're diluted by 50%. So you can change the flow and, and change the dilution effect if, if you want. But there's a lot of characterization that we didn't do. Um, this is just kind of like a basic characterization. Kind of, it was a proceedings paper, so it was one of those, hey, do you want to collaborate on this? Like, quick, get a paper in. 
Okay, so, uh, so it has promise, but it still needs some characterization. But here are some, um, here's a comparison we did with TEM where we did rapid insertion. So we had um, our TEM grid, you know, um, injected into the flame and pulled out quickly. Um, uh, so on the, so these are, you saw these data yesterday, right? Um, the, we have LAI and SACS showing where the particles are in our flame, right? Um, and then on the right-hand side, we have the particle diameter of the primary particles in the aggregate um, assessed with SACS measurements, with our analysis using SACS. And on, in the green, it's TEM using the jet entrainment sampling um, technique, where we take that, those particles that are entrained into that jet and hit a, um, a TEM grid and then do TEM on it. Um, so just like you know, showing you yesterday, in the middle of the flame, we have mature soot, like our aggregates that look pretty typical, have the right um, fractal dimension that, or the, the typical fractal dimension of, for aggregates. Um, higher up, where we see the soot going away in the LAI and SACS, that's where we have oxidation, and the particles look like they're oxidized, they've gotten smaller. Um, and then lower down, I think I probably didn't show all of, the, you know, all of these images yesterday, but lower down, we think we have coagulation in the sampling probe. So this is one of the areas that we need to figure out how to address, and that's probably what we need to do is better dilution, um, somehow to, to um, incorporate kind of maybe, um, a, instead of a straight tube, maybe a bigger a tube that gets, goes bigger and we inject more nitrogen or something, some, some way to keep the particles from crashing into each other and sticking together. Um, uh, and then we can compare that with uh, TEM from the rapid insertion technique, thermophoretic sampling. Um, so that's on the left. So the primary particle size from that is on the left. And you see that you know, there's actually pretty good agreement for some of the heights. But in the middle, we have some issues. And this is what we're seeing is um, even at five millimeters, we don't see mature soot. Um, uh, at, at six millimeter, at seven millimeters, we do, um, and at eight millimeters, we do even um, where we think there should be oxidation. Um, there's no coagulation at the bottom, so that's a good thing, um, and we don't see any particles below four millimeters. And I think actually what's really happening here with this technique is the grid is actually pretty large, our flame is pretty small. And we basically kind of have like a, a it's, it's hard to get the, as I was saying before, it's hard to get the right resolution for particles when you have a big grid and you're, you need a better spatial resolution. So it's not that this technique is, is, is completely bad or anything, it's just that it's really hard to get the right spatial. Um, so this is relative to the center of the grid, right? And I, I just think that it's, it's hard to do that with this technique. And it, and it does perturb the flame. Especially this flame, it's not a very big flame. If you have a bigger flame, it's probably easier to do the more reliable measurements using this technique. This is definitely a standard technique that we've used a lot over time. OK, so the conclusions for this is um, there are advantages. Um, we're not sticking a probe in the flame and perturbing the um, radical distributions, temperature so much. We don't have services for, for quenching um, um, and catalytic you know, reactions. Um, but there's definitely room for improvement. Like, especially we need to figure out how to deal with the coagulation at the lower uh, heights in the flame. And the other, the other issue with this technique is you notice we, if, if, so when you have a hole in the tube, you can actually place it, like if you want to just look at the particles that are in the center of the flame, they're going to have different, you know, they're going to be very different from the particles at the edge. But when we send the jet through the flame, we're actually sampling the edges and the center. So we, we don't have that um, distribution. If we want to do the edge, just look at edge particles, we could move it over to the edge. But if we want to look at the center particles, it's really hard to do it with this technique. We have done, we have used it in a premix flame where we actually put the probes in the flame and shot through the flame. So it's a little bit easier because you don't have these edge effects. You don't have that distribution, radial distribution. But um, so, so that's a real drawback with this technique. Yes? 
Oh, that's a really good idea. Yeah, that's a really good idea. The, another thing I thought about is not having a coannular flame and having, so we, we started to try to do this, um, but it, so if you have a slot, a slot burner, and on the ends, so you get end flames, um, but if you put nitrogen on the ends instead of the oxidizer, you can reduce that effect on the ends, and then you could shoot down the center of the flame, so you basically don't have a, you know, a cylindrical setup, uh, and that might be another way to do that, but we haven't you know, had time or chance to try it. There, there are so many things, so go for it, do it, do it. Tell me what you see. <laughs> um, so yeah, yeah, so there, I think there's so many ways to improve this, and this is really an area that we need, um, you know, we need people working in um, helping to understand soot formation and evolution. Okay, so um, are there any other th like thoughts or questions on sampling? So the question is, how do you account for sucking an ambient oxygen from the coflow, right, into the flame itself? Um, so that's a really good question. And um, we often will actually put the probe so close to the flame that we can see it, you know, perturb the flame. Like, we'll put it all the way up. That's, I mean, this is the hardest, one of the hardest problems is getting rid of the oxygen. Um, and you're right, this is uh, um, something that we really need to work on. And um, so we will put them it right up at the edges of the flame, but then that also perturbs the co-flow. And we don't want to perturb the co-flow. It perturbs the flow field for the co-flow, and we don't want to do that either. Um, but uh, I think with we have so much dilution so quickly, and it is cold, so it's not in a hot tube as it's flowing down. The nitrogen itself isn't getting hot, you know. As we're, I think it really helps that we're actually quenching it so quickly that we don't have oxidation. So so far, we haven't seen oxidation with this jet entrainment technique. Yeah. Yeah. You're welcome. Thank you. Okay, so yes. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so you're, are you talking about the nozzles that are the sampling of the fuel injector? Oh, the, the soot um, accumulation on the, fuel, on, on the fuel injector. Yeah, I don't know of a good technique to look at that. That's a, that's a really interesting problem. Um, and you mentioned LAI. Uh, you, um, the thing is metal can give you LAI as well. So, you know, your whole system can, you know, is, is if you're trying to look just at the soot, it's really kind of complicated to do. Um, you might be able to uh, look at the spectral emission if you use, use laser heating and look at spectral emission because the metal and the soot will have different emissivities and different wavelength um, dependencies. That would be an interesting thing to try. The other issue is when you start to heat up that hot with like when you're trying to do LAI, you actually blow things apart, right? If you're hitting a surface, it's going to really blow the soot off of your probe, right? Yeah, so that's uh, off of your fuel tube that you're look, trying to look at. So that's a really difficult problem. Um, I don't have a good answer for you. Yeah, yeah. Now I'm going to start thinking about it. That's really interesting. Yeah. Um, did, uh, did someone else have another question? I saw another hand up, I thought. No. Yeah, no? OK. OK, so let's talk about um, uh, institute diagnostics. So um, an area I spent quite a bit of time like trying to uh, figure out different ways to measure soot. You know, it's actually a hard thing to do because 
Spectroscopically, there are no like signatures, right? It's just broad, um, uh, so it's it's hard to, um, and except for the fact that it changes, you know, the evolution of the spectral signatures change over the lifetime, the evolution of the particles and the flame. So you can use that. We talked about, um, but there are diagnostics we use, and I'll I'll talk about those, and then talk about ways that we can um, add new techniques. So one of the things that I've been working on is, as I was saying before, is um, X-ray techniques because we've done a lot with um, with uh, laser-based techniques, and we're um, you know there. Are, I figure there have to be some other uh, opportunities to do other techniques. The problem with X-ray techniques is they're hard to implement. You have to go to a synchrotron usually, or have some kind of X-ray source in your lab. Um, if you want ever want to do an experiment at a synchrotron it's actually really pretty straightforward as long as you know the, the whole process of getting beam time. Um, it's uh, so that um, process is you basically, wherever you, you wanna go, there are synchrotrons in China and Europe and um, US, um, and you just figure out like what kind of technique you wanna do. You look in the literature, see what other people are doing. And then, um, there's a whole process for getting beam time. You just write a very short proposal, three-page proposal, and you submit it. There's like two, you know, for the synchrotrons I work, work at, it's, it's like two times a year you can submit a proposal, and then the cycles go like six months, like sometime within the next six, if, it, if you get scored well enough, sometimes within the next six months you can usually do your experiment. Um, and then that proposal is valid usually for two years or something like that. And so you can do experiments every six months for the next two years if your proposal is scored well enough. And it's free. Like, you know, this beam time is paid for. It's a community um, uh, facility, um, and it's, it's open to anyone. Like, so you, it doesn't matter if you live in the U.S., you can go to the one, one, one of the U.S. synchrotrons. So any of these techniques I'm talking about at a synchrotron are, is something you could do. Um, the... What's uh, the, and and I'd say there it's kind of like a big adventure, like and you're given beam time and it starts at a certain time on a certain day and you better make sure you have everything working and you're all set to go at that time. That's the most stressful part. Is like, I we usually take a ton of equipment with us and it takes us a couple of days to set up and we're like madly trying to get everything to work before beam the beam turns on, um, and then you're doing these often you're doing these shifts at. Um, or like night shifts or, you know, sometimes 24-hour shifts, sometimes 48-hour shifts, you know, it can be grueling. Um, so when, when I, I was talking about um, working with people, it's, um, this is a time where you want to choose your coworkers well, <laughs> because when things aren't working at three in the morning, you don't want a grumpy coworker. <laughs> you want to have someone who's like, oh yeah, we can solve this, let's try this. You know, um, so uh, it, it's, it's a really interesting experience if, if you think of something you want to try, it's um, a really interesting thing to do. And get in touch with me, I can tell you how to like, try to go through the process of getting beam time. Um, so, so here's a technique that I've been looking at, trying to figure out if we can use it um, to measure incipient particles, because um, you can't use lasers to measure incipient particles because um, the wavelength is too long compared to the size of the particle. Um, with the, you might, you, in theory, should be able to use this um, SACS measurements to measure these nanometer-sized particles. So far, I haven't been successful. That doesn't mean it can't be done, but I'll tell you, show you kind of the complications of the technique. But basically, you take your, your um, X-ray beam, you send it into your flame, it scatters off of the particles, um, it also scatters off of the gas phase, so that's the, one of the big complications, onto a 2D detector, and you know the two D detector is something that's sitting at the synchrotron. You know it's not it's the, it's part of the facility, so you don't have to worry about the detection part. You don't have to worry about the the data collection part. You know it's all set up for people to use. Um, and and you look at the angle of the X ray scatter. Um, so this is what you know you might get for signal um, and on your two D detector. Um, and then you integrate azimuthally, so you integrate over the angle that goes around, you know, the circle, and you end up getting um, a, 
a curve that looks like this, which is signal as a function of this parameter Q, which is the momentum transfer um, parameter. And that is basically this equation. Lambda is the synchrotron, the wavelength you're using in the experiment, so from the synchrotron, the x-ray wavelength. Um, and uh, uh, theta is the angle relative to the, um, the beam, the scattered angle relative to the beam. So, so you end up with this um, uh, curve. And you can see we did this as a function of height in the flame. And you get different signals as a function of a height of a burner. And then when we go and subtract the, um, the gas phase background, which is the monster in the problem here, um, we get something that looks like this is what your soot signal looks like. It doesn't look all that pretty. <laughs> like it's a kind of like noisy um, over in the right-hand side. And this is exactly where you have the incipient particles. And so the problem is, when you have incipient particles, they're not that much different in size from your gas phase species. Your gas phase species are getting pretty big once you have particle inception, right? Um, it doesn't seem like they're that big, but they're, they're big enough to ha cause a problem when you go to subtract the signal from the gas phase species. When you go try to subtract that signal, you also run into the problem that um, different temperatures, which are different heights in the flame, different heights in the flame will have different temperatures. So you can't, you can't just take a background with no soot and with soot and subtract that background. So you have to figure out what is the temperature effect. You know, the density of gas will change as a function of temperature, and you're scattering off different you know, gas phase part. And, and also, what is the composition effect? Because you have composition is is also changing its function of height in the flame. So it's not like you can just turn off the burner, make a background measurement, you turn off the flame, make a background measurement, and turn the flame back on again. You just can't do it. You have to account for the, um, the composition and temperature of the background. So that's where it gets really hard. Um, and, I, um, and, and there are ways that we, we uh, try to do that um, and, and did that for this. You know, to, Took me about three years to figure out an approach to subtract the background for this for this flame. Um, so this is what it looks like when you're running an experiment. You have like this huge tube that is your scatter. Where your your light scatters down that tube. The detector on on this picture is on on the left hand side. The flame is that little tiny orange dot where the arrow is. It's tiny compared to the rest of the experiment. Um, and then you're not in there with the experiment. You're actually in a control room. It's like being at NASA. And you're you know, running this whole thing from a control room. In this experiment, you actually have a little window so you can even see if your flame is lit. In a lot of places, like a, you don't actually have any way. You know, maybe there's a camera that shows your, your flame to make sure it's, it's lit and you're not flooding the, the hutch with um, your fuel and oxidizer, <laughs> because that could be a disaster. Um, often, you'll run into the, the beamline scientists will um, be a little bit nervous if you have a flame, flame at their beamline for the very first time, because um, people have had issues with like lighting things on fire in the different synchrotrons, and, and people get really, really nervous about this. You have to just keep talk them, talk them down from the cliff and, and say that you, you can handle it. Um, OK, so, so, so then you get take that signal. You have a, some kind of model. And there are different types of models for looking at particles. Um, so uh, and then you go ahead and, and uh, analyze the data using the model um, for scattering. Um, so um, this is what the background signal looks like. Um, as a function of temperature, like this is just a whole bunch of different temperatures um, for the, and you can see, like that's no soot, that's like not the uh, uh, part, soot doesn't even include soot. And then you can see now, um, I've broken it down so you can see the relative signals depending on where you are in the flame. But five millimeters, that's where we saw a lot of signal, right, up um, with the LAI. Um, that's the bottom panel on the right hand side. You can see the soot signal is really, really low in that um, compared to the gas. The soot signal is in blue. The gas phase signal is in green. So the gas phase signal is higher than the soot signal. 
um, in this region, right where you want to see incipient particles. So that's really the problem. And then there's like the instrument um, background, just scat random scattering from the instrument, and that's also pretty high up there um, in the pink and uh, dotted line. Um, yeah, so it, it, it gets really kind of, kind of complicated. So then there are other techniques. So here's, this is what you do for a SACS measurement. Um, there's also um, uh, small angle scattering, neutron scattering. So you can scatter electrons or you can scatter neutrons. Um, in electrons, you're um, uh, sensitive to electron density. With neutrons, you're sensitive to the, um, the nucleus. So you might get different information depending on whether you did, um, sorry, sorry, um, X-ray scattering versus um, neutron scattering, right? So, so comparing, actually doing these experiments and comparing them is really interesting. So these people did, um, this group did um, both SACs and SANS um, on the same configura flame configuration. So these are, these are actually two different papers. Um, and you can see, uh, the, uh, there are advantages to SACs that you have better resolution um, and, and sensitivity. Um, the measurements for both of them are really difficult. And the advantages of, of SANS, neutron scattering, is you can, it's easier to actually figure out what the background is relative to your signal. So, um, so I feel like I want to try SANS just to figure out if, if we can under, like, use that measurement to understand the SACS measurements better. Um, OK. So that's um, x-ray scattering. Oh, yeah, and here are the results, a comparison of the results for SACS on the left and SANS on the right. Um, so, the, so I've pointed out like two um, curves that are, so, and they're both as a function of radius, right? On the left-hand side is um, the, I tried to point out where, this, where the measurements were made at the same height of a burner in that same flame. Um, and you can see that there's a big, there's kind of a difference between the two measurements as a function of radial position. Um, where um, SACS actually sees particles a lot, like the kind of the highest density of particles is at the center, where SANS, there's no part of, you know, goes, the signal goes to zero at the center of the flame. So it's kind of, kind of interesting. So I kind of, I really want to understand more. There's not a lot that's been done using SANS, but I think it might be a really interesting experiment uh, to try. Yes, what's your question? Okay, so the question is, how does, um, is it, are you talking about SACS or um, SANS? How does that, so let me tell you how SACS differs from XRD um, uh, first. So remember, X-ray diffraction is, is uh, we talked about X-ray diffraction yesterday, and that's a way, if you remember, um, that can give you constructive and destructive interference when you scatter off of a material and you can map out the different, um, the spacing between the, uh, um, the, the different layers, for instance, in graphite, or you can um, even see um, the distance between the, like the repeated separation of, the, of one side of the six-membered rings and a sheet of six-membered rings. So it gives you different um, kind of resonant, uh, con like constructively interfering um, building up of signal at, at particular um, locations. Um, the, the difference between X-ray diffraction and SACS is that you're, um, you're, you have your detector pulled way out on, on SACS relative to X-ray diffraction, so you're looking at the small angles. For X-ray diffraction, you're looking at wider angles. And X-ray diffraction is actually a lot like almost, it is basically uh, whack, what we call wax, wide angle X-ray scattering. So that's what XRD is, X-ray diffraction. Is that what your question was? Yeah, yeah, okay, so, so that was a, that's a really good question. Yes, you, you're right, it, they're both X-ray scattering. Um, and I think I have something on wax. I, actually, I went through it this morning, I don't remember seeing it. 
Um, but that's what wax is. So wax is X-ray diffraction in situ. So you can do wax in a flame. Yeah, exactly. It's hard. It's hard to do. You have a lot of the same problems that you have with um, sacks and um, and only a, only a, a maybe one one very brave group has tried it, um, uh, and it's been hard for them to extract uh, information from the data. But but I think you could probably do a better job if you used a free electron laser. So um, we're instead of having I should have put in a, a, a figure where, where of the synchrotron. How is it, so how does a synchrotron work, right? This is kind of interesting. I don't think I, I remember to put this in there. So, uh, so when you took physics, a physics class, do you remember that if you accelerate a charge in a field, um, you'll get light emit emitted, and it's a relativistic effect? It's called Bremsstrahlung. Right, so it's so you're accelerating a charge in a field. So if you have um, electrons, so a synchrotron is circular. It's like a big uh, ring, um, and you inject electrons into this ring, and you you basically you often like accelerate them in another ring, and you inject them to this ring. So these electrons are going around this ring. Um, but the way a real synchrotron is set up is you basically have, it doesn't, the electrons don't want to go in a circle. You have to make them go in a circle, right? So you have these um, regions these, um, that bend the trajectory. So they're, they're basically a magnetic field that bends the trajectory. Um, so when you change the direction of a, of a moving um, object, that's an acceleration, right? It's changing the direction is an acceleration. So every time you change the direction of an electron, light will come off. So what happens is you have all these what they call bending magnets, or, or you know, there, there are other uh, ways to bend electrons. But say there, you have every time you put one of these magnet, magnetic fields here, you will get a beam of photons. Okay, so. And then the photons will have a distribution of wavelengths, and, you, and usually different, these, in, in a real synchrotron, each of these would be called a beam line. And each beam line has a different wavelength. They, they kind of select a different wavelength region for each, each beam line. And then usually they put you know, the experimental stations over here. Those are called end stations. And so when you go to try to get beam time, you, you decide, OK, I'm going to work I want to work with um, hard X-rays, so that's you know like say 20 kiloelectron volts, okay? And and you'll go contact the person who's on that beam line, or you, you know there are a lot of other wave photon energies that you might want to work with. So that's how um, a synchrotron works. Um, with a synchrotron, then you have all these beam lines, and when it's running, there are uh, maybe a huge number of groups that are using the synchrotron. For a free electron laser, it's kind of um, an interesting thing where you basically have electrons going linearly, usually down this like um, long, maybe two two kilometer long um, path, and you wiggle. You have these like fields that will um, make the elect electrons wiggle, and every time they wiggle, they emit some photons. Um, so it's like a it's like a uh, a laser with distributive feedback is what you would call it in, in um, laser science. That makes one long beam of coherent photons. Where these are not coherent, a, la a free electron laser is coherent. So, so that's the difference. So if you have a, a coherent source, you might be able to do some really interesting uh, wax type measurements um, with a free electron laser. OK. I mean, that was an aside, um, but uh, I should have added some of that in, into, into this lecture material. Um, anyway, so that's the difference between, so let's move on to some, something that you can probably do in your lab. Um, so laser-induced incandescence is a really um, popular, really useful technique, um, and people, I think, really started using it um, initially when, when they figured out how to do this in engines, to look at soot, soot um, uh, formation in engines. And it's really sensitive to soot. 
and not to, so if you, so what they did is they made um, some windows on, they so made a, a special experimental um, cylinder with a quartz um, cylinder wall so they could inject a laser or they had an, a, a laser beam coming from the bottom where they reflected it along up into the cylinder. But either way, you have light coming into your cylinder, you make a light sheet. Um, if you're to look at just the signal of the scattering, you would be scattering off the fuel droplets plus the particles that are generated. Um, when you use um, laser-induced incandescence, you only see the soot, soot that's formed because what has to happen is you send your laser in, it absorbs the light, it heats up and emits incandescence, and that's what you measure. So you, you don't get that from field droplets. One, they don't absorb very strongly, and two, if they absorb and heat up, they're just gonna vaporize. So there are a couple of characteristics of, of the um, particle that you have to have. It has to absorb strongly and it has to be refractory. It can go to high temperatures before it kind of breaks apart. Okay, so, um, so people use it for volume fraction measurements, for particle sizing, I'll talk about this, um, and then for um, understanding um, particle maturity. Okay, um, yeah, so those are the characteristics. Um, and, and incipient particles don't absorb uh, strongly enough um, and get to high enough temperatures for you actually to be able to see them. So you only see mature soap particles. Um, okay, so this is kind of, you know, like what a basic LAI type of signal would look like where you have the laser profile and the red dotted, you know, you have, we, we usually use something like a nanosecond type um, time scale. Shorter time scales like um, femtoseconds, too short to have the process happen where you actually heat the particle up. So it has to absorb and, and um, that energy that's absorbed has to be turned into um, thermal energy, okay? So um, at low fluences, which is very often where we use this technique, um, you, or it depends on the, what you're trying to do. You have, during the laser, so the signal, LA signal is in blue, the solid blue line without symbols. So um, during the laser pulse, the um, particle, uh, the signal increases. It's not instantaneous with the signal because it takes a while to heat up and then emit light. The temperature is the purple with dots um, so what happens is you can see the temperature of the particle heating up during the laser pulse as it is absorbing and heating. And then it stops heating after the laser pulse is over. And the bottom, um, you actually have the particle heats up really fast and then it starts to blow apart. Like it gets to the sublimation point and boom, you start to lose your signal because you the particle vaporizes, it sublimes. So the signal is dependent, if you look at the top, the volume, of the particle times temperature to the fifth power. So you're highly sensitive to temperature of the particle, so you really wanna get that particle to high temperatures. In fact, if you wanna do volume fraction measurements, you wanna get it to the sublimation point. Then, you'll, so then if you know what your, you, all your particles are coming to the sublimation point, the same temperature, they're gonna stop there, you'll be sensitive to the volume fraction. So right when the particle hits its maximum, that's gonna be your volume fraction. So if you take the peak, I'm gonna show you a whole bunch of figures where you take the peak of that LAI signal as a function of time and plot that as a function of laser fluence. Um, and this is what that looks like. Um, so that's a, a laser fluence on the bottom for both of these figures. Um, the top is the peak uh, particle temperature and the bottom is the peak LAI signal. So you can tell a lot just from this, um, this uh, fluence curve. So this is, so this is you know, uh, you know you, we'd have to modify how you implement the technique if you're gonna do this in a sample that's varying, like a turbulent um, system and you wanna have instantaneous particle measurements. This is with a steady flame. Okay. Um, so this is you know, an example of what some of the peop people have started with, with LAI. And notice that you, know, you can, you send your laser and, and you do it at like say 1064 nanometers where you're not gonna, it's not, if you have a shorter laser pulse, a uh, shorter laser wavelength, what's gonna happen is you'll excite um, laser induced fluorescence of the gas phase species. But you can take advantage of that fact, do a lower fluence um, 
simultaneously send in a lower fluence, shorter wavelength, so 532. So a YAG laser has 1064 as its fundamental wavelength. 532 is a doubled, you double it with a doubling crystal. Um, so LAI is at the top, so that's 1064. Um, and this is a sheet of light, so you're looking at the LAI from, this is actually in um, an engine cylinder um, in, a, in a, a direct injection diesel engine, um, looking at where the soot is being formed. This, the second image is the laser-induced fluorescence um, from the 532 nan nanometer light. And the, or that's actually 355. Um, so that's, again, you do another stage of, of mixing um, and to get 355 from the YAG. And then the bottom is um, particle image velocimetry with a double pulse um, to map where particles are moving, to looking at scatter from particles as they move. OK, so, so that's actually really cool to be able to um, send uh, laser pulses in and, and get all this information in an engine cylinder. This is under high pressure, yeah. Real quick question on the uh, PID. Are they just using the particles as C? You know, I don't know the answer to that question. That's a really, so the question is, were they using the SIP particles as a seed or are they using um, other, the, usually people will put um, particles into the flow to image it. I actually think they weren't. I think they were uh, putting particles into the flow, yeah. Um, okay, so, so that's uh, um, LAI. So it's, it's a nice, because it can be used under a lot of different conditions. Um, this is how you would use um, LAI if you want to get primary particle size. Um, so uh, notice on the top, it's the like signal as a function of time. So those are you know you like relative to the laser pulse, it would be nanoseconds on the very left hand side, and they've expanded the um, time frame all the way out. I didn't show you that in the figure I showed you as a function of time, but if you wait long enough the particles are actually going to be um, conductively cool. So, um, so that's why the particle, the signal is going away. They're actually cooling. Um, and in, in this um, experiment, what they did is look at different heights above the burner and then looked at the time trace for the LAI. And then they used a model that um, did a good job of conductive cooling because Conductive cooling is going to be dependent on the surface to volume ratio, and you have a model that basically solves the energy balance and mass balance equations um, for soot once you, you heat it up with the laser, um, and you can back out um, primary particle size. So that's what they did here. So as you um, increase in particle size, the conductive cooling will be slower, right? And the, the smaller particles will cool faster. Okay, so that's, that's a, um, I mean, there's a drawback in that you have to have a really good model, energy balance model to do this. There is another drawback I'll, I'll introduce in a, after, probably after the break, um, but uh, people use this technique a lot to, to measure particle size in situ without having to extract from the flame. Um, this is another technique. Um, it's just a elastic scatter, but you can get a lot of information uh, from scattering, like uh, multi-angle, wide-angle scattering. This is, these are 2D images, though, just from looking at scatter. You can get um, primary particle size here. They've gotten soot volume fraction from the scatter. They have a, an estimate for the radius of gyration, so how big that, that aggregate is. Um, uh, and then uh, using all that information, then you can back out what the number of primary particles is in the... Um, in your sample. Um, so what's nice, I'd say, the biggest advantage of using these scattering techniques is you get aggregate size. It's, it's a nice technique for getting aggregate size um, in your lab without having to go to a synchrotron. Um, yeah, so we should take a break now. Um, and uh, we'll reconvene in uh, 15 minutes. <laughs>